Um, thank you very much. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce the Minister for the Environment, Heritage and Local Government, Mr John Gormley TD. Uh, Mr Gormley is also the leader of the Green Party, um, has been an elected representative since 1991, uh, is a former Lord Mayor of Dublin and has been engaged in politics for many, many years as an environmental campaigner. So with that we'll ask the Minister to say a few words. Thank you. Well, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, let me start by saying a big thank you to University College Cork for the invitation to speak here today. Uh, I understand that this is the seventh annual Law and Environment Conference, and I commend you here in the Faculty of Law for that. Uh, environmental law is a growing body of law. I think, therefore, that you can rest assured that you'll have material for debate and discussion for many more conferences. Most of you here, I think, are, or many of you at least, are legal practitioners, and you know the law perhaps better than I do. That's your role. It's my responsibility as Minister for the Environment, Heritage and Local Government to legislate, to make law in response to our commitment to sustainable development, including environmental protection. I've added to that body of Irish law since coming to office almost 22 months ago by signing into law nearly 100 statutory instruments. Over half of these relate directly to environmental protection. That growing body of national law is generated in the main from our membership of the European Union since 1973. There are now over 200 pieces of environmental legislation in the European Union, including more than 140 directives, most of which have now been transposed in this country. Much of this EU law is generated in turn by international agreements. I'm told that the first environment-related multilateral treaty dates back to 1868, the revised Convention on Navigation on the Rhine. However, the vast majority of multilateral environmental agreements have been adopted since the Stockholm Conference back in 1972. According to the UN Environment Programme, there are today more than 500 international treaties and other environment-related agreements. 70% of these are regional, including the Aarhus and ISPU conventions. There are currently 45 multilateral environment agreements of global geographical scope, including the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and the Convention on Biological Diversity. It almost seems as if uh, more damage, uh, the more damage that we actually do to the environment, the more that we regulate. And that's uh, a natural and I think an intuitive response. More than that, it's an essential response until we actually get it right, until there is no longer a need to regulate. Unfortunately, I think we're a long way off the mark. For example, in the areas of climate change, waste, environmental liability and planning, uh, I think we need to make much more progress, just to highlight a few. On the question of climate change, and I understand there has been a lot of discussion on this particular issue, and rightly so, uh, because it is the biggest environmental challenge uh, that we face, and indeed uh, the greatest environmental th threat, I think, to the welfare of humankind. This threat can only be tackled by coordinated international action, and the European Union provides the optimum opportunity, I think, for member states to advance this agenda. We are doing this internationally through the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. The European Union is leading international efforts to tackle climate change, and this is why I am fully committed to Europe, and this is why I am also supportive of the Lisbon Treaty, which will formally and specifically recognise the threat of climate change and it was indeed at the behest of uh, this Irish government with the participation of the Green Party that this particular clause was included. At the end of 2008, following a long and tough year of negotiation, the European Union agreed the so-called Climate Energy Package. That package was formally adopted at Council on April 6th and is now binding law in the European Union. It's now a matter of transposition and implementation in the respective member states. The package is evidence of the growing body of environmental law. It is also evidence of environmental law evolving to meet needs to address new challenges and to embrace new scientific and technical information. And I believe, ladies and gentlemen, that we will get an agreement in Copenhagen. 
I'm very hopeful now with the Obama administration on board and I was talking to my colleague, the Danish Minister for the Environment there recently who had been on a visit to the United States, had spoken to members of the Obama administration that we can get that agreement and of course once we get the 20% uh, reduction in CO2 emissions there, we in the European Union will go to a 30% reduction which is a very ambitious but also very necessary target. On the question of waste, um, I would just say this, that if climate change is my priority, then waste management is not really far behind. Our response to climate change must, of course, be both global and local. Dealing with waste management is essentially a national and local issue. It is simply not good enough that we are still struggling to meet our ambitions and obligations in regard to waste prevention, recycling and, crucially, the diversion of biodegradable waste from landfill. The looming targets of the Landfill Directive are a key driver in the latter regard, but they are not the only ones. Landfill is, uh, I think with limited exceptions, a redundant methodology. I also believe that simply placing an equally unbalanced reliance on incineration cannot be regarded as an acceptable solution. There are a growing suite of technologies to biologically and mechanically manage our waste which cannot be prevented in the first place. I am determined that they, these technologies will be fully exploited. Te technology is uh, one key aspect, the creation of the legal, policy and institutional arrangements to deliver best practice and best solutions is of course the overarching requirement. That is why the program for government I in the Programme for Government I actually secured and the Green Party secured a commitment to a major review of waste policy. I'm now delivering on that and consultants have been engaged to carry out a comprehensive study to underpin that review. That study is on schedule for completion in the summer. I shall then consider its recommendations and bring necessary legal and policy proposals to government. Uh, but can I say that even before we do that, we have secured agreement uh, already at government level in relation to both landfill and incineration levies. I hope in the very near future to hold uh, a seminar in the Custom House with many of the waste companies um, to look at how quickly we can now deliver, particularly in relation to mechanical and biological treatment. Uh, and I think we need to follow that up and I'm currently carrying out as well a strategic environmental assessment uh, in relation to the whole question of the, the direction of waste, uh, which I think is absolutely essential. I think it is within our own gift as a society to create a new paradigm in waste management, one which does more than pay lip service to the waste hierarchy, one which actually ensures that waste prevention has real meaning and that valuable materials are harvested for reuse and recycling, one which ensures that a much diminished quantum of waste is treated in as environmentally progressive a fashion as is possible. I'm determined to lead on this delivery uh, and I believe that we can do this as I said and I believe also that by doing this we will actually meet our, our landfill targets. It will be difficult uh, but the landfill directive can be met. I'd like to move on now to the environmental liability directive. The Environmental Liability Directive will feature in your deliberations, as I understand it, uh, this afternoon. The transposition of this directive in Ireland has proved to be complex and lengthy. I've tried to affect transposition in an effective and in a practical manner. Two rounds of public consultation were undertaken on the various uh, options for transposition and the views of all interested parties were assessed. The European Community's Environmental Liability Regulations came into operation on the 1st of April last. They seek to promote compliance with good environmental practice by inducing those concerned to adopt measures and develop practices that minimise the risks of environmental damage and reduce their exposure to financial liabilities. I'm hopeful that this will result in a higher degree of environmental protection and minimise the needs for enforcement. While the regulations meet the transposition requirements, there are a number of discretionary provisions which member states may choose to adopt. It is my intention to provide for certain discretions in primary legislation later this year. I'd like now to turn to planning law and it was a privilege to address uh, the uh, UCC planning department there not so long ago and I think uh, it's fair to say that there is always scope for amendment of our planning legislation to maximise environmental protection. 
I believe that the planning system is critical to sustainable development, including environmental protection. Our provisions for environmental impact assessment, which are based on a regional international uh, agreement, the ESPU Convention, and on EU directives, are particularly important. I intend to seek government approval shortly to publish a planning and development amendment bill. One of the primary aims of this bill will be to ensure a greater coherence between national spatial strategy, regional planning guidelines, development plans and local area plans. Generally, the bill will seek to address the need for tighter management of land zoning. This is to ensure that the location and quantum of land zone for development is closely linked to government economic policy and to national and regional planning priorities. It must also be linked to national infrastructure programs and crucially, I think, to policies relating to climate change and sustainable transport. The bill will address one of the main issues at the centre of a case taken by the European Commission against Ireland at the European Court of Justice, that is the compatibility of the Irish retention planning permission regime with the provisions of the Environmental Impact Assessment Directive. The bill will provide amendments that are intended to address the Commission's concerns and the Court's ruling in relation to the legal regime for enforcement in relation to cases involving environmental impact assessment. The bill will provide for appropriate assessment of the impact of plans and projects on Natura 2000 sites and restrictions on approval of plans and projects that could adversely affect such sites. It empowers local authorities to acquire land to create ecological sites, for example, where they might need to purchase land to create compensatory habitat in the context of infrastructural works. I look forward to the enactment of this planning bill during 2009. The government's economic recovery plan places the green economy centre stage and reaffirms a 40% target for renewables by 2020. It's a very ambitious but achievable target. The introduction last year of planning and development regulations to exempt certain renewable technologies represents just one innovative policy measure. This measure achieves the twin policy objectives of removing unnecessary regulatory burden while also progressing national energy and climate change policy. Thanks to these regulations, exemptions from planning permission requirements now apply to a range of renewable technologies for use across the industrial, agricultural and commercial sectors. My department will soon take over responsibility for the foreshore leasing regime uh, for offshore wind, wave and tidal energy projects. I believe that there is real untapped potential here from an energy security and renewable energy perspective. I've made mention of some imminent developments in environmental law in Ireland. There will be more. For example, negotiations are taking place in Brussels on a recast of the Directive on Integrated Pollution Prevention and Control. I'm working to introduce new primary legislation on national monuments and on noise uh, nuisance. Uh, and uh, while they may not seem like the major issues, I can tell you that um, particularly in relation to noise, uh, and I speak as a, an elected representative, this is something that comes up quite regularly at residence associations. And I think it is about time that we did have a proper noise nuisance bill, uh, and it will seek now to give powers uh, to the guardee to issue on-the-spot fines. And uh, it's a simple thing like that that allows people to see um, that uh, there are measures in place to protect their quality of life. On the whole question of uh, archaeology, uh, I am pleased to say too that the landscape conservation area, the very first one to be introduced in Ireland, is progressing in the Tara Screen Valley. Um, there was a lot of controversy around this, the, the, the road going through there, and rightly so, and certainly I was opposed to it. But I'm hoping, and I'm very confident at this stage, that we will not get the unnecessary development along that road. And that is what I think has caused most concern, because on, on too many of our roads we get this, uh, too many of the B and Qs, and a lot of that unsightly development, and that certainly isn't uh, appropriate in a location as sensitive uh, as that. I'd like to move on now to speak about public participation and about enforcement of environmental law. The UN ECE Aarhus Convention goes to the heart of the relationship between people and governments and is about government accountability, transparency and responsiveness. At its core, 
It links environmental and human rights, acknowledging that we owe an obligation to future generations to bestow on them a clean and protected environment. I'm a firm believer in community involvement in decision making. Ireland has recently agreed to lead an expert group on public participation under the auspices of the Aarhus Convention, which I believe demonstrates our support for the concept of public participation. It gives me no pleasure to acknowledge that Ireland has yet to ratify the Aarhus Convention, and I hope that we will be in a position to do so in the very near future. We have the legislative framework giving effect to the first pillar of the Aarhus Convention on access to environmental information. Ireland is now very largely compliant with the public participation requirements of the Convention and the related EU directive. There remain a small number of consent systems that need to be amended to bring them into compliance with the public participation directive. They are the responsibility of other ministerial colleagues, and I'm referring here to agriculture and uh, the OPW. Uh, and I'm sparing no effort to ensure that these systems are amended as necessary and as soon as possible. If the phrase uh, environmental law has now got common currency, I'm glad also that the concept of environmental crime is also beginning to take root here. Other EU member states have perhaps a better developed sense of this concept, but we are, I believe, catching up fast. We now have a growing body of law to counter such crime. This ranges across the spectrum of air, water, waste, habitats, and now the much broader construct of environmental liability. It is, of course, one thing to have a corpus of law in place. It is quite another thing to actually enforce it. Lack of enforcement has been a recurring feature in the environmental law cases taken against Ireland in the European Court of Justice. We have started to address this. We are building capacity. The Office of Environmental Enforcement is now fully deployed. I know that the European Commission has identified this institutional approach as a model of best practice. And in my own discussions with uh, Commissioner Dimas, uh, he said that he is happy uh, with the progress that we're making in relation to the Office of Environmental Enforcement. Indeed, I know that some of my colleagues from the EPA have been over there to discuss these matters with the Commission. The local authorities are and will remain the usual first responders in cases of environmental crime. We have added significantly to local authority enforcement capacity, including through grant aid, which I've been happy to provide. There have been improvements in the enforcement of planning and environmental law by local authorities, but there is a long way to go yet. I'm sending out a message now to local authorities that they must take their enforcement duties seriously. There is no need for extra legal powers. They have the necessary legal powers and they must use them. I will be considering what levers are available to me to bring about such an improvement in enforcement. And I must emphasize that even in the current economic climate, resources are not an impediment to inf effective enforcement. And that needs to be stated very clearly. I know also that the Gardaí are now much more engaged in countering this type of crime. The involvement of the National Bureau of Criminal Investigation in some of the more serious cases has assisted the bringing of prosecutions on indictment and the much heavier potential penalties which should apply. The final element in all of this, of course, is the attitude of the judiciary. I'm absolutely respectful of the autonomy of the courts. But I will say that I'm happy to note that there is a growing willingness on the part of judges to see environmental crime as those of us here today uh, would see it. Not as some victimless misdemeanor, but at least in the more serious cases as presenting a severe threat not just to the natural world around us, but also to our health and general uh, well-being. I would say, though, and I'm sure you've if you've been to the court yourselves, that you've had the experience sometimes where uh, perhaps the judges uh, need to uh, brush up a little bit in their understanding of uh, environmental law. Um, there, there are cases where I've seen where it's, it's clear that um, some of the basic concepts, and maybe I'm going back a while now when, when I was a campaigner and standing before a court myself, uh, that, uh, that there needs to be, I think, um, some form uh, of education or some form of 
uh, way of, of you know, allowing the judges to understand the basic concepts of environmental law uh, and uh, it's something that I, I would like to tease out further because I think it's a, a, very, it's a crucial element in how we progress uh, you know, the sustainability agenda in this country. Further developments in support of more effective enforcement in the years ahead will include the transposition by December 2010 of the EU Directive on the Protection of the Environment through criminal law. I note that Owen McIntyre in, is speaking on this uh, topic later uh, today. My department and I will be interested in the input and views of legal academics and practitioners in relation to the transposition of the Directive. I will in the near future initiate a review of the Environmental Protection Agency promised in the Programme for Government and that will include a review of all legislation relating to environmental fines. As you know, we are also working to meet the requirements of a number of judgments of the European Court of Justice across the spectrum of environmental law in Ireland. Actions taken will further add to the growing body of environmental law in Ireland and advance the evolution of that body of law towards helping us in meeting our environmental protection objectives. Ladies and gentlemen, I opened with the remark that environmental law is a growing uh, body of law. Uh, and I think you'll also agree that it is an evolving body of law. Um, but I would say to those of you, and it has been my experience to those of you who are involved uh, in the legal profession, it's often been said that all of the professions are a conspiracy against the laity. Uh, and uh, too often, as I see it, when we are really interested in public participation, and I've seen this over and over again, where um, ordinary people are simply confounded by the complexity of, of, of this and very often if they're making an appeal they cannot do it on their own. Uh, they require experts to come in and it is extremely, as you know, it can be extremely costly. Um, so I would hope that we can in the next number of years at least, at the very least, simplify this. Simplify simple things like development plans, make people understand that uh, you know, they have a right, um, they can go forward, they can uh, engage with the process. Uh, and uh, I think it's up to all of us, be we, be, be those of us in the um, political class, those of us you know, in, in, all, in, in the legal profession, to actually help people. What we're trying to do is to assist people. I'm very glad to say that one thing that we have done, I see some uh, of the colleagues here from the environmental pillar, we have now included um, environment, the environment pillar, pillar as part of social partnership. Uh, and I think that will be an enormous step forward because what we will be doing is integrating uh, environmental and sustainability oh, and that sort of thinking into our economic decision making and we will from the very outset I think be ensure, ensure that people have an input into the way our society is governed uh, because for far too long and I think we can we can all say this with, with, with total honesty that uh, there have been decisions made during the Celtic Tiger era which ran contrary to the whole thinking of sustainability we have to, now is the opportunity, we now have to get things right. Uh, and we can get it right by ensuring that people have access to environmental justice, by ensuring that they understand the concepts uh, of sustainability, and by enforcing uh, environmental law. Uh, and I hope that at the end of my tenure, and the end of our tenure in government, that we will have achieved all of those aims. Thank you very much.